Hello and welcome to the Financial Fox, Finance, Investment and Crypto with a Twist. I'm your host, Steffi B. I'm the founder of PR company Cassiope Services. And every week I bring to you my favorite conversation with investment experts, market disruptors, mover and shakers, and the coolest project in crypto. Today we take a break, so don't expect so much finance or investment, but there is a bit of investment. We focus more on fashion, which is my my other passion, and uh, I'm sharing with you the conversation I had with Daniela Loftus, founder of This Outfit Does Not Exist. Daniela is very active in the field of digital fashion, and with everything that is happening with NFT, the rise of metaverses, fashion is going through a complete revolution. And it's very exciting. So I'm sure that if you are a fashionista, you are going to like this interview. So let's go straight into it. Hi, Dani. How are you? I am good, Steffi. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. So such exciting things are happening in uh, digital fashion and um, I was looking um, at your profile and you see that you have started a new company. So I said, oh gosh, what is going on? And uh, you are doing quite a lot of stuff in the space. So maybe let's start it. How do you get into fashion? So I've always absolutely loved fashion, you know, ever since I was very young. I've loved dressing up. I love the artistry of it. I loved the mission behind it when I was watching, you know, fashion shows like Alexander McQueen and Tierra Mugler coming up. Um, and then I got slightly older. And I think during the 2000s, I didn't really think that the value system of fashion was aligned with my value system in terms of it being very exclusive, not particularly sustainable. And so I pivoted and I actually went into emerging technology and innovation. So worked in that field for, you know, five years. And all of my friends were in fashion and I still followed it closely, but always kind of more as a passion. And then I would say in the last couple of years, I started really following what was going on in fashion technology. And I started to see that maybe the prejudices that I had when I was younger in terms of saying, you know, this industry isn't values driven, it isn't um, sustainable, you know, it isn't innovative. Obviously, as my generation grew older, people were coming into the industry and bringing that to life. So I started saying, actually, maybe this is an industry that I could be interested in and get involved with. And just, you know, around a year ago, started blogging and started, you know, showcasing on Instagram, virtual fashion, which, and I became the first person to ever do that. And that is essentially clothes which are produced and then worn fully virtually. So it's both digital fashion that can be worn on human beings through filters. It's also clothes that can be worn direct to avatar. And it was this essentially this idea that this fashion could be innovative, sustainable and accessible for anybody, uh, regardless of where they were in the world and regardless of their price point. I think I familiarize with uh, everything you said so much because I love passion a lot, but I never kind of fully went into it just because it was, uh, yes, exactly, different valuables, different values, different uh, um, kind of thinking as well in principle. But at the same time, and now what we are seeing is that all the industry is evolving and there is a complete evolution revolution going on. And that's so exciting. But what I'm basically seeing is like, um, there are lots of brands that they are going into the space. So we have seen Louis Vuitton, Burberry, Gucci, you know, Balenciaga partnering with, partnering with games, uh, now Adidas, uh, you know, with Sandbox, so the metaverses are stepping in. But for me, it looks like lots of experimentation and uh, not much of like uh, a strategic plan. What do you think? Really interesting. So I think exactly as you said, I think at the moment there is a lot of experimentation. And I think partially that is because nobody really understands the space. You know, traditional brands don't understand the space because it's so alien to them to be going into a digital first environment. You know, before the pandemic, a lot of the luxury brands didn't even have developed e-com stores. So to then say, actually, we're going to be selling fully digital goods, you know, is mind blowing for them. And I think that they also currently see those as marketing opportunities. And so rather than saying this is a fully diversified revenue stream or a fully diversified vertical, 
they are really just saying, okay, maybe this is a way to redistribute um, attention towards our physical products by grasping consumers in the digital realm. And I think what you're going to see in the next five years is a movement towards people really taking this fully digital world very seriously and actually selling and investing and selling a vast quantity of items there. Um, the one thing that I'll say, which gives these fashion houses, you know, a bit of credit is that nobody knows yeah. what the secret to success is in, in NFTs. So many of these projects are completely random, essentially. You know, they definitely have some components, you know, a strong community. But if you look at NFT art, there is so much out in the market. And how would you know that, you know, crypto was going to be the thing to succeed? It's all based on actually a new type of consumer preference, which I think consumers are figuring out for themselves right now. So there isn't a playbook that they can look at and go into. So, you know, experimentation is the best thing they can do in the market. And I think as long as they're doing it authentically, so, you know, re-engaging with this new community, really making an effort to understand them and their culture, then it's actually completely fine for them to do. Yeah, I think that's, um, it's, it's, it is a challenge because uh, from one side, there is the problem of interoperability. So we see experimentation among different platform and, and really it's so fragmented that it kind of like, it's very hard to make sense. Um, but, but also there is the power of that this digital community can bring to, to, to design, to brands, actually. Um, so maybe do you think that we can see some kind of like unification of the space in the next two years? Or you think because it's kind of like we are seeing brands fighting at each other, right? One, they want to succeed there. The other one, they want to succeed in another way. So it. Is that going to be a place where um, all the brands are going to be merged, like a big marketplace, or perhaps that will be, I hope not, but, you know, maybe fa ex formally Facebook and Meta? So it's a really, really interesting question. So I think what ultimately is going to happen is I'm one of those people who doesn't think that there can be metaverses. I see the metaverse as one thing, which constitutes lots of smaller things in the way that there can't be many internets. So I see the metaverse as this persistent virtual layer composed of these smaller virtual worlds where people can, you know, go between that they will all have certain characteristics. So you'll be able to do your job. You'll be able to socialize. It won't just be challenge-based environments like you have at the moment in games. And I would say in a number of the different worlds that will exist or virtual worlds within the metaverse, it will be important for designers to have presences. However, what I would say around that is that there will be certain virtual worlds which attract certain people. So for example, you know, it's the difference between the people who go into the game World of Warcraft or go into the game Roblox. I would assume that the people in World of Warcraft are not looking for, in general, a Chanel dress. I could be wrong. But people in Roblox, maybe, if you look at all the success that Hilfiger has had or Gucci, are actually looking for that. And so in the same way that brands will target prime real estate these days, and, you know, you wouldn't find Chanel next to a football stadium, or in a football stadium, but you would find them in a high-end mall, they will find the virtual worlds which best appeal to their goods and their consumer base and where they know that their market is concentrating, and they'll go into those worlds. And so it's a, it's a really interesting question about meta. Um, it's interesting to see how they try to execute, but what is so exceptional about the metaverse is what I would hope is, even if they manage to get their own certain chunk, let's say, you know, 5 million people or 4.5 billion people end up being in meta because that's the amount of people who are in social media at the moment. That's, you know, that's a very large collective. But ultimately, especially with designer brands or fashion brands and luxury brands, you're not looking to be somewhere where everybody is. You're looking to be actually in the curated communities where your audience is. And so I think a lot of the different worlds have abilities to stand out for curation and filtering. Yeah, I think uh, I, I kind of agree with you. I think each brand will have, uh, you know, so will have their own community as well. So that means they will gra gravitate towards a different kind of metaverses uh, of metaverse to different kind of um, virtual spaces. Let's call it like that. And, and hopefully uh, we are going to reach to a stage where I can wear my Chanel bag in one 
situation and then at the same time I can take it in another space. I think that will be uh, the next level where really digital fashion can become more mainstream. Yep. What will be other uh, challenges you see for digital fashion to become mainstream? So I think what's going to be one of the challenges is um, is convincing, I would say, like, you know, let's say the generations above us, the importance of digital. And I think, I actually don't think it's going to happen, nor do I think it needs to happen. I think, you know, our generation and the generations younger than us have these very established digital identities. I've always said that I don't think the traditional luxury consumer who is, you know, 45 and goes to Louis Vuitton or to Chanel to buy a luxury leather good is going to want to buy an NFT. I think that's an entirely new generation. I think to try and appeal to those people is actually wrong. I think there can be a very interesting use of digital fashion in terms of its abilities to optimize, you know, the design for that. So, you know, if you can transition towards a made to order model, then you have the ability to behave more sustainably and actually also appeal to that consumer. But I think they're always going to want physical goods, whereas the generations below are going to want digital goods. And I think in terms of challenges i would say one of just you know the key challenges and it's something that i'm trying to build to address is the fact that at the moment these platforms operate as walled gardens or the most popular platforms so let's take Fortnite, which through one selection of skins made 50 million dollars last year and you know that's our entire revenue pretty much comes from skins it's a free-to-play game you cannot wear a skin you bought in Fortnite somewhere else you can also not trade it it's not yours essentially it's it's fortnights and you can wear it on platform which is yeah which is the equivalent of having a gorgeous dress that you've invested a lot of money in that you can't first of all wear anywhere but in a specific neighborhood and secondly you can't resell on if you decide to get tired of it and i think that actually ends up really curtailing the ability for first of all creators to actually make money from their creation but secondly for consumers to really leverage the value of digital fashion, especially for their identity. You don't want something that's only linked to a specific platform. You know, even though to counter that, you may have a specific identity in a specific platform. In general, you want your wardrobe to be yours. And so I think that's an issue that we're still facing. I think that could be perhaps a fix with the, the rise of uh, uh, digital identity and avatar and people kind of like real people owning their digital avatar. Perhaps uh, technology is going to enable also um, to have wearables that are really yours and they are more interoperable. But another challenge that I see to be so if we come back to Meta, for example, and we think about which is still a Web2 company, um, the, the rise of NFTs and, and, and Web3 is teaching us or is telling us that really the power can be in the community. And when I see brand like uh, Louis Vuitton or Balenciaga or, you know, Burberry going into gaming and creating this new opportunity is still like a very top to bottom approach rather than like a horizontal approach. And I'm not really sure how much power they want to give to their clients, right? Or their users, but they are more maybe focused about making money. So about their revenue stream, How you know, um, Morgan Stanley said that is a $50 billion uh, market opportunity. So I want to grab a piece of that. Uh, how that can be changed? How do you see um, a revolution happening to kind of uh, make the space a bit more horizontal? And actually the consumer is not the consumer uh, only anymore. There is a little bit more nuance to that. So I think that's a really brilliant question. I think you've really touched on something, which is digital fashion actually has values which are opposed to traditional. So traditional fashion is gated. Designers and brands act as the tastemakers and they tell consumers what taste is. And, you know, income isn't fairly distributed and it's incredibly top down. Like what taste is, is established by the major fashion magazines and the brands themselves. Whereas digital fashion, it's an idea that anybody can enter the industry at a fraction of the cost. What taste is or what's desirable is decided by the consumers rather than by the producers who say this is in style. And it's this idea of consistent fair reimbursement. And I think what's so fascinating, especially when you go into Web3, so, you know, NFTs, blockchain-based technology, which really bring these digital fashion values of equity and distribution to life, 
It's really the fact that it's inevitable. So I think the way that I see Web3 is I think for designers and brands, the large luxury brands, already this transition has started happening with the shift to social media. So what you have as Gucci or Burberry, et cetera, when you have a social media post is you're not only appealing to the people who have the capital con to consume your goods, you're appealing to the brand's fans. So, you know, you saw it with Dolce & Gabbana when there was an advertisement in China, which actually got cancelled by, you know, this whole community saying, actually, no, this doesn't, you know, this is an incorrect representation of us. It's not just the people with the dollars, it's actually everybody voting. And what you then get when you move from social media, where you can vote with your social capital, to these systems where actually you can vote with your financial capital and tokenize is brands have to listen to the community and what's going to be seen is it's not going to be a community of people where necessarily you know burberry and gucci etc have brand value i think it's interesting because you saw it with streetwear which obviously came up as a human first or people first movement and then all of the big brands realized they had to get in so they did collaborations and all of that but that's not you know, inherently, if Gucci, without doing a collaboration with Supreme, tried to appeal to a streetwear audience or without conforming to that aesthetic, it wouldn't work. And so it's going to be the same in the metaverse. I think the digitally native consumers coming up will actually be attracted to digitally native designers. And in order to get in, you're going to have to collaborate with those designers. And I think one of the best examples which we're seeing of it right now is this is the way roblox works and so within the roblox platform there is the ability to you know if you're a normal person create a t-shirt if you have a premium membership create a t-shirt and pants but if you actually want to go in as a brand they partner you with their existing creators so these people who have audience who have traction who understand the market and who have you know a lot of you know agency within the platform and a lot of esteem within the platform to move them forward so the whole Tilfiger collaboration was in partnership with eight roblox native creators and so it's this idea of finding those who are digitally native and using them to bring in brands because brands can't do it by themselves and so they are going to change that ethos because what we as a community are looking for are those values so so basically brand identity is going to be completely shake up by the community i mean the, because if you if you are Gucci, let's say you have got your idea, your desi the designer has basically the vision, you know how he thinks about the collection should be, and then and then the community is going to completely shake the bat because that's the only way the brand is going to survive. So the question that, that that comes to my mind is really how brand identity is going to survive and how it's going to be shaped by the community. It's not going to be a chaos, or I mean, what kind of rules is going to follow? So I would say, I mean, I think nobody knows what the rules are yeah, yet, but I think what they're going to have, what's basically going to have to happen is, first of all, it's going to be this amazing, I think, demand responsive product cycle, which we don't see in traditional fashion. You know, in a normal business, you say, okay, you know, how do I make something the consumer wants? Whereas fashion is how do I make the consumer want something? So, you know, things go down the runway with almost no, you know, consumer validation things are then put in stores with no consumer validation and you know then there's 40 percent overstock per season whereas people voting with their tokens or voting with their dollars and also it being more accessible is going to mean that brands need to say what do people want and what do they respond well to and that's super exciting yeah i think that will definitely i mean this is all the point about digital fashion is kind of like also um, fix the problem of waste. But talking about sustainability of waste, because this is like a subject that, um, you know, I've been looking uh, into quite a lot. And uh, obviously most of the project now building NFTs, they are on the Ethereum chain or a side chain solution. We actually are consuming a lot of energy. So if from one side you are, um, you know, you are saving on waste and overproduction, on the other side, you are consuming more waste digitally uh, that could be consumed physically. Um, is that like you do you have a specific view of perhaps a specific chain that you think should be the one uh, uh, the favorite one for uh, digital fashion evolution or you think you know that the future we see and technology is gonna overcome this problem so i think the future we'll see i think a couple of things need to be true though for the chain that succeeds first of all it can't have high gas fees 
So it can't be the situation you have right now with Ethereum where you're trying to buy something and it's going to cost you an additional $200. Like that can't happen. It needs to support a lot of transactions. It needs to be, it, I don't think it can be proof of work unless proof of work has been revolutionized in some way where it doesn't consume so much energy. However, obviously, you know, it needs to be decentralized. It needs to be secure, et cetera. And I think one of the biggest challenges to mass adoption is the fact that there are still a lot of steps to go through to get a Web3 native digital fashion goods. So you need to create a wallet. Then what if your wallet breaks? What if somebody hacks your wallet? You know, you then have to pay gas fees. You may not understand what that means. You then may not have utility once your NFT is in the wallet. So I think all of those components need to be tackled. And I think there are a number of blockchains that are tackling them. And I think whichever... I'm going to be really interested to see which one comes out on top. And I know quite a lot of are working on, you know, these various, you know, potentials. And then it's also about, you know, integration. So you want a wallet or you want a platform which allows you to properly display your digital goods. And so that's going to need to be compatible with, you know, the correct chain. And so I think I'm not, going, I'm not prepared to make a statement now, which is the blockchain to kind of bring digital fashion to life. I think a number of projects are built on a number of different ones with pros and cons. But I think those things, the low friction UX, the speed of transaction, um, the, you know, the low financing behind transaction all need to be true and the sustainability in order to make something successful in the fashion space. Yeah, and the interoperability, as we mentioned above, because there is no point only to wear a digital dress in one space and not being able to wear it in the other. Now, I know that you're also involved with Red DAO, and uh, uh, Red DAO was one of uh, the organization that both one of the fantastic, super, superb pieces of, pieces of Dolce Gabbana Genesis collection. So, uh, because of this, uh, in this channel, we talk also about investment. I wanted to. Uh, um, see what you think about investing in uh, digital fashion as digital art, as NFTs. So, um, yeah, let me know. And then make a comment also on the collection from Dolce Gabbana. I'm really curious uh, to hear what you think. So I was so excited when Red Dow came to me. So essentially Red Dow um, is a part of Flamingo Dow, which is the leading digital art Dow. And, you know, they've, they invested, actually, they started only a little bit over a year ago, which is crazy due to the impact that they've made. And it was this collection of, you know, both creators, investors, enthusiasts who really wanted to bring digital art to life. And I think they've more than managed it. And then they said, you know, digital fashion is a really important vertical. And I think that was so exciting for me because I've obviously I've been in the digital space, fashion space for a while and people do not see digital fashion the way that they see digital art. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. I think that fashion as a good in the physical world experience is wear and tear. It's not an investable asset. And therefore, people's brains just switched off when they said digital fashion, whereas they can understand that art is an investment piece that holds value. And it's also obviously traditionally female centric and therefore, unlike art, which is also appealing to a male collector market, it just didn't quite click in a lot of people's minds why it was so hyper valuable. And so to have a collection of people come and say, actually, this is where we're putting our money, not, you know, for creativity, not just to be nice, but actually because we think this can go up in value. I think it was so important as a stick to the market. And I'm really excited over the next year for actually more and more collectors to actually say, oh, this is something with value. There's something with financial value, not just creative value. Um, I, th I think uh, I think that's uh, such an important point that you brought to the table, which is uh, um, about the fashion is a. Uh, kind of has been considered like a women centric and that's perhaps is why it's not it doesn't have so much consideration when it comes down to finance and investment even though you know you can buy an Hermes bag and it's really really expensive uh, I mean it's really an investment um, so yeah maybe it's also like a social um, paradigm a social value that has to be has to change um, yeah, that's, I think it's quite an interesting point and I haven't thought about it. Um, yeah. Okay. So, um, talking about your project, um, yeah, just tell me a bit more what you are up to, you know, what kind of things are you going to be, um, coming out soon with? Yeah. So I originally got into, you know, this industry as somebody who was, exposing and educating around the industry. So, you know, I started, you know, became the first digital fashion influencer, 
I, you know, have written quite a few long essays on the space and, you know, being one of the first to do that and being one of the first to kind of educate in this space and also worked very closely with the Fabricant who are doing really phenomenal work. And, but over my time in the space as kind of, you know, an investor and as a writer, one of the things that I realized was that, as I've said on this call, there is a lack of actually, you know, people realizing the monetary value of digital fashion. And there are a number of phenomenal projects who are doing, you know, various things in the space that help this be realized. And this is that, you know, a lot of them are coming out next year. But something that I really wanted to focus on was actually using the idea of money as the core. So how do you maximize the value of digital fashion goods actually just as financial assets and what can then be spun out from that so you know i see actually providing people with financing as the way to bring the creativity into the space um, as a way to empower those those designers so i wanted to say okay first thing is actually financial value and what can come out of that so the platform that i'm building and this is the first time you know first time i'm ever discussing this in an interview which is very exciting yeah. um, it's called drop and it's basically the idea is how can you maximize the value of digital fashion for creators and consumers? And so I went through the things that I was talking to you about and saying, okay, why does it not have value? So it doesn't have value because at the moment, the majority of platforms where it can be worn don't provide routes for it to be bought and sold. If you're buying it as an NFT, it can't be worn. So, you know, therefore for wearers and therefore for collectors, it doesn't become a valuable good. And actually is a good, what I would call a good in its own right. So it's good as a fashion garment. So, you know, having a picture of a blazer or a picture of a top, that's not digital fashion, that's digital art or fashion photography. You need to be able to wear something in a way to make it fashion. And so the platform that I'm building will, first of all, be a marketplace where creators and consumers can sell and resell their digital fashion. It will then be wearable, both in what I'm going to design as a really premier digital wardrobe experience. So, you know, you as a collector could can show it on an avatar to yourself, to others, and have it really beautifully displayed. Whereas at the moment, it sits in a MetaMask wallet as a static image, exactly. which you don't curate and you can't see properly. And then this idea of bringing it into actually the worn environments where it has value. So the stuff that I said to you about the fact that you're not going to want to wear, you know, a dress in world of warcraft so where actually is digital fashion given that social value which is the equivalent of you wearing it where people can truly appreciate it and so once that that which forms the foundation is made then the next step is saying okay building on that how can we further maximize the value so this idea of rental i'm going to integrate into the platform um, so you know you may have a limited edition dress but somebody else wants to wear it they can do that with automatic reimbursement i'm also going to do where to earn where you know, a brand could say, you know, I want Steffi to wear my garment and for the amount of time you wear it or for the conversion, they could get directly reimbursed. So it's all focused on monetization. And, you know, the things I said to you about the blockchain, um, it needs to be very, very frictionless because I want to use this as an opportunity to bring women into NFT. So at the moment, um, I think it's something absolutely minuscule, like 5% of those NFT artists who benefited uh, in the last year were women. And you know, 16% of those with crypto wallets are female. And it's because you have these male communities and, you know, it's a very high friction experience still. And I love this idea that digital fashion could begin as something you're excited about wearing, but then realize you hold actually a valuable asset that you can monetize. Um, so that's what I'm really focusing on this year. Yeah, it's fantastic. I mean, the opportunity of monetizing on uh, on fashion is uh, is crazy. I mean, and it's quite in the physical world, it's quite difficult because there are all these like third party, for instance, if you are reselling something, you know, they are all taking so much con uh, commission that it doesn't really become uh, an easy place um, to kind of uh, use. So if that could be in the digital world where a platform can actually help uh, um, women and also fashionista to really make money or some amazing gar garments, um, considering our life is going to be more and more in the metaverse. I mean, I love it. And I love the idea of uh, uh, the fashion wardrobe. I think this is fantastic. And uh, yeah, um, I think it's really cool. Really, really cool. And then also, you know, avatars don't have problem about weight. They don't have problem about uh, I can't change my hair. So actually, 100%, 100%. everybody could be who really wants to be. 
exactly. you don't you don't have to oh gosh maybe i can't wear this skirt because uh, you know my ankles are big or my ass is massive <laughs> that, so that's it's so interesting because when i wrote my white paper i put that in and my cousin who you know who's, who's a man who read through it went i don't understand why this is important and i was like you know so many people do not want to participate in fashion or maybe don't want to wear something that says, look at me because they don't like how they look. Yeah. The second, you can craft those qualities to yourself. You have an excitement about engaging with fashion, which you would have never had otherwise. Yeah, it's the, like the passion for fashion can really shine uh, rather than being restricted by barriers. Uh, and, and thanks also to the avatar, to the digital version of ourselves, that can be possible. Okay, Dani, it was such a great interview and such great chatting with you. And I'm really looking forward to see, you know, what's next, um, you know, with your project. So all the best. And thank you for coming on the show. All right, we arrive at the end of another episode of The Financial Fox. I'm really looking forward to your feedback, to your comment on this uh, such interesting subject. So if you are a fashionista, don't hesitate to get in touch with me at Steffi at Financial Fox. News and let me know your thought if there is anything you think we should cover in the next episode. Also, remember, if you are not subscribed to our YouTube and podcast channel, please click the subscribe button now and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our news and interviews. I'm sure that you are going to find some very interesting content. So until next time, I wish you a fantastic week.